Welcome, everybody. Um, it's 5.01 and some more people may join us, but uh, just to be respectful of your time, let's get started and they can hopefully catch up if people log in later. Um, I want to say, first of all, thank you so much to Paul Majewski, Dr. Paul Majewski, who's joining us tonight, and also welcome to all of you for joining us as we celebrate Earth Week. My name is Rachel Grady, and I'll be your facilitator for the evening. Um, let's see. Oops. There we go. Uh, we ask you that you please keep your microphone on mute throughout the presentation to help with background noise. You'll see a microphone symbol located in the lower left of your screen as shown here on this slide. If the microphone symbol is crossed through, then you're muted. And that's great for during the presentation. Next to that, you'll see a video camera symbol. You're welcome to stay on or be off video at your choosing throughout the presentation. This webinar is being recorded. So if you wish to not be seen, feel free to turn your video off. Lastly, we invite you to put any questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll have some time at the end of the presentation for Q and A. There we go. Um, before we begin, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land beneath our feet. Here in Maine, we live in occupied Wabanaki territory and the Wabanaki people lived on this land and stewarded it for thousands of years. In these times, particularly, indigenous communities are being hit hard by the pandemic and in most cases have fewer resources and less, less support. So please consider making a donation to support your local Native American tribe. At this point, I'm gonna stop my screen share and introduce Dr. Paul Andrew Majewski. Um, Dr. Majewski is an internationally acclaimed glaciologist, climate scientist, polar explorer, and director and professor in the Multidisciplinary Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine. Paul was born in Scotland where he was introduced to hiking very early in life. And he has thus far led more than 60 expeditions to the remotest polar and high elevation reaches of the planet. He has received many prestigious awards for his and his team's contributions to science, including the discovery of abrupt climate change driven by atmospheric circulation, human impacts on the chemistry of the atmosphere, impacts of climate change on humans and the ecosystem, and for achievements in exploration into uncharted regions of Antarctica, for thousands of kilometers of polar traversing, and for numerous first ascents of mountains, all to gain scientific knowledge. Paul is the first person to develop and lead prominent multidisciplinary climate research programs at the three poles, the Arctic, which is consisted of, of, which consists of 25 institutions, Antarctic, which is 21 countries, and the Himalayas and, and Tibetan Plateau, which is 34 international researchers. He has had approximately, he has had approximately 500 scientific publications and two popular books, The Ice Chronicles and Journey into Climate. And he has appeared hundreds of times in media, such as the New York Times, the LA Times, on NOVA, NPR, the BBC, CBS 60 Minutes, and the Emmy Award-winning Years of Living Dangerously. Thank you so much for joining us during Earth Week, Dr. Paul Majewski. Thank you so much, Rachel, and uh, thank you to the Sierra Club for this invitation. Uh, and uh, I look forward to spending some time with everybody over the next roughly hour, hour and a half. And also happy birthday, 51st birthday to Earth Day. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about quite a few things uh, and ideally tying them all together. I'm gonna to start with talking about climate change in various parts of the world very briefly. Uh, oops, here, I press the right button. And then I'll talk about Maine uh, in the context of what we've discovered in other parts of the world. And I'll also talk about what's happening in Maine today. And I'll also introduce you to the first abrupt climate change event of the modern era, which has <clears throat> quite an important impact on us. So the first question is, how do we figure out what's going on? The, uh, there's the earth in the middle of today. Uh, we all know what it looks like. Uh, we know that in the past, it, it's been colder in the very distant past, it was warmer. And how do we understand all of the things that have actually been changing around the planet? In order to do that, we need some perspective. 
uh, and the Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine, which is, by the way, uh, one of the oldest climate research units in the world. We're 50 years old next year. We use several different techniques to gain perspective. Uh, the first is to look at what's going on in modern day climate. That's really the last 100 years of instrumental record. And we also look at the last 30 to 40 years of remotely sensed information. Uh, to do this and package it much of this together, we've developed, or my colleague Sean Burkle has developed software called Climate Reanalyzer, which you are all welcome to use. We get about 3,000 hits a day. It allows you to take a look at today's weather and also go back through time, look at a lot of the data. As you can see, the graphics are, are quite pretty. In order to understand more about the climate system, we can't assume that everything that's happened to climate has happened within the last 100 years of instrumental record. So we go into the past. It provides analog for colder, warmer times, and it also helps us to understand what the full dynamic range of the climate system is. And for example, how fast it can change. And both use, using both the present and the past, our intent obviously is to understand what's going to happen in the future much better. And we do this by monitoring what's going on today. We, in the very broad sense of, of science, not just our team, uh, and we also look at climate models and we'll look at all of these. I'm going to focus on one mechanism that we use in the beginning, at least, uh, for understanding past climate, and that's the recovery of ice cores. That's what my teams and I have been doing all over these red dots uh, for a little bit more than four decades. And we've used ice cores in order to understand the physical, chemical, biological, and social aspects of climate change. Climate change is a rapidly emerging field. When you think about it, it actually touches so many uh, aspects of our lives. <clears throat> and one of the big points from this presentation will be to show you, in fact, how critical it is for us to not only deal with climate change, but to understand what's going to happen in the future. And I'll, I'll put the pointer on, on the screen here. Ideally, you can all see it. Uh, we recover ice cores from ice sheets like the Antarctic, which is on average about 10,000 feet in thickness, also places in Greenland. And we also recover ice cores, again, this little red box uh, from high mountain regions. And we do this because it allows us to understand past rates of precipitation, temperature. We can look at chemistry that comes out of the ocean to tell what's going on in the ocean. We can de determine how much agriculture occurred in the past, what the productivity was like in the ocean and on land. We can see dusts coming off deserts. We can track volcanoes. We can look at industrial activity on and on and on. So it gives us a very robust record. And this record uh, has gone back in our work actually more than a million years, but it's gone back continuously 110,000 years, year by year. And in fact, we've developed new technologies technology now that actually allows us to look literally at storm scale events uh, going back many hundreds of years. So all of that chemistry that I just showed you is constantly moving around the planet. And if you, uh, this is actual imagery from NASA. It's a series you can see in the upper left. Uh, the clock is ticking and it shows you what's happening to the atmosphere. Uh, let me just point out a couple of things. The, all of the colors on here were put on artificially by NASA, but they do a beautiful job of explaining how the atmosphere is, is dynamic and impacts so many areas. This orange area here is coming off uh, North Africa and the Sahara, and these are Saharan dusts that are making their way all in, in, literally into Southeast United States, into the Amazon. They contain a lot of iron. They go into the ocean, which helps fertilize the ocean and the Amazon. If we took a, take a look at this bluish area, <laughs> these are uh, low pressure systems that surround uh, the Antarctic. And they're blue because they're supposed to represent sea salt. If we take a look at the green areas, these are areas of biomass burning. And the white areas that we're seeing in the Northern Hemisphere are intended to show pollutants coming off not only North America, Europe, but obviously off Asia too. And note that obviously, uh, based on this dramatization, there's a lot less pollution, obviously, in the Southern Hemisphere. So I'll talk 
very briefly about five areas uh, and that we've been working on on a global scale since 2018. Uh, and just to give you a flavor of why we're working in other places. And the first is the Andes. Uh, we've been working in the Andes for quite a few years, uh, but uh, also since 2018. And one of the big issues in the Andes, of course, is the recession of glaciers uh, with climate uh, change and warming, greenhouse gas warming. And these glaciers are critically important in the Andes because they provide hydroelectric power for agriculture, a uh, whole variety of things that in, for example, this particular case, which is Peru and is relatively arid, uh, is extremely critical to the sustainability of not only the people, but also the ecosystems in this area. And the quick answer to this is that the glaciers in the Andes are retreating dramatically. There are literally places uh, where you would have gone 20 years ago and you would have seen a glacier and the glacier is now gone. Uh, we've been working on pandemics of the past. Uh, this, this comes primarily from uh, a region along the Swiss Italian border right in here. It's called Col Nefetti. We drilled an ice core here and we learned some interesting things about pandemics. Uh, because we develop a climate record, uh, we were able to tell that the World War I swine flu which killed 50 million people, impacted 500 million people, actually came at a relatively unique time in the climate uh, history. It was a relatively wet and cold time. It also happened during World War I. So for the people who were impacted, in particular Europe and Asia, half uh, a large number of people in Europe and Asia uh, died. Uh, not only were they stressed by World War I, but they were stressed by the pandemic in this particularly wet and cold time, which of course we know now in COVID time that it's typically in the winter, in the damp winters that we are most affected. Another thing we learned uh, going back in time to the 1340s and 50s was the Black Death. And as it turns out, if you take a look at the lead record, our record goes back 2000 years, you see variability in lead, the highest levels of lead in most recent time. Uh, but around the period of, uh, not around, exactly during the Black Death, the levels of lead in the atmosphere recorded in our ice core literally went down to zero, which means that that's probably the natural level and that everything else that's higher than that is caused by something not natural, obviously humans. This is mining of lead uh, and also smelting of metals using lead. So this tells us that the health standards that we have for lead, which are currently based on levels just prior to the onset of the Industrial Revolution around 1850 are probably not telling us really what the natural levels of lead are in the atmosphere. They should be pretty close to zero. Uh, so this, this actually was an important uh, finding because lead is related uh, to heart disease and it's also related to Alzheimer's and, dement and dementia. We've been working in the Southern Ocean uh, in many ways and, and all over Antarctica, most recently since 2018, we've been sailing in the Southern Ocean to access islands, particularly uh, these islands in, in the South Atlantic. And these are of interest to us because the glaciers on these islands are melting. As they melt, they're pushing uh, debris and, pollu and pollutants and also iron into the ocean. And we wanna find out how the organisms that live in the coastal sites uh, on these islands and how the ocean might actually change in productivity as a consequence of this of the influx of all of this chemistry coming out of glaciers that have been accumulating this uh, chemistry since the Industrial Revolution. In addition, uranium pops up a couple of times today. Uh, turns out that uh, in Australia, it's the largest open pit mine, uh, uranium mine in the world. And we discovered on the Antarctic Peninsula, on the other side of the Southern Hemisphere, that uranium from that mine made its way to the Antarctic Peninsula in the last 35 years, increased by 100 times the level of uranium in the atmosphere. We've also been working in the Andes for many years, uh, interested again in pollution and also water resources. The Andes are the largest source of uh, ice 
in the world outside of the polar regions. There are about 70,000 different glaciers. Uh, and we focused most recently, it's 2019, on Mount Everest. I was invited by National Geographic and Rolex to be the leader of the Mount Everest expedition. Uh, and we did several things. Our team drilled the highest ice core ever collected in the world, 26,000 feet, and implanted the two highest automatic weather stations in the world, 27,500 feet and a little, bit, a little bit below that. And why did we do that? It's because we know very little about the climate history of the, the roof of the world, uh, where, in fact, uh, the top of the earth comes in contact with the highest with the second highest level of the atmosphere the stratosphere we live in the troposphere just below that and in order for climate models to do a better prediction to be able to predict better for the future we need to know more about the uh how the what the behavior of this high level of the atmosphere has been doing for the last few decades. And we can tell this from the ice core and from these automatic weather stations. We also implanted the weather station at 27 and a half thousand feet uh, in order to help climbers have a better understanding of the best days for trying ascents on Everest. We've also been working in the Arctic uh, as obviously because the Arctic is warming and I'll have a lot more to say about that very very briefly, but let me just come back to uranium for one second. Uh, for those of you who've been following the news of what's going on in elections in Greenland, which you may or may not have followed, it's been a big debate for the last 20 years about uh, whether or not there should be mining in the coastal sections of Greenland, the West Coast. Why is mining so important? Uh, right now, the largest rare earth metal uh, deposits in the world are in China. And China absolutely dominates rare earth metals, which we need for cell phones, jet fighters, everything that is in, in our new modern technology. But the second largest deposit of uh, rare earth metals is believed to be in South Greenland, or on the west coast of Greenland, I should say, and it's often associated with uranium. It turns out that one of the South Greenland sites is being uh, projected uh, for open pit mining of uranium and rare earth metals uh, happens to be very close to a region of that is culturally very significant uh, to the Norse who moved there since about the year 1000, and obviously to the local uh, people, the Inuits, because they raise sheep uh, and they have farms. And right in the middle of a World Heritage Site, there might very well be an open pit uranium mine. And in the election that occurred last week, the people of Greenland, 56,000 of them, uh, decided to vote for a political party that would be less likely to have open pit mining uh, for uranium in this area, which is very important, obviously, not only to them, but everybody downwind, including Europe, based on what we know from the Southern Ocean. So let me, using, using the Arctic as a, as a sort of a platform for much of, for at least a portion, I should say, of the rest of the presentation, I'd like to talk about the Arctic main first to brought on a change event. Look at the red uh, arrows down here. You can see that Maine is actually not that terribly far away from Greenland. In fact, South Greenland is a lot closer to Maine than, uh, than California is. And we know that there are tremendous changes going on in Greenland. But back in the 1980s and 1990s, when we were mostly visiting Greenland to understand about the climate of Greenland, uh, we undertook a program uh, called the Greenland Ice Sheet Project 2, which I had the, the honor of leading for quite a few years. Uh, and we recovered from the center of Greenland where this red star is by drilling 10,000 feet down right to the bedrock in Greenland. We recovered a year by year record that goes back 110,000 years. It has never been done since. It's the longest such record that's available in the Northern Hemisphere. And we did it to be able to understand natural climate variability by having a very detailed year by year record. And we also did it because we wanted to understand how different modern climate is since humans have begun to emit a variety of things versus natural climate. <clears throat> we discovered many, many interesting things, but the thing that's probably most notable is the following. If you take a look at this sort of cartoon-like graph going from zero, which is today, back 110,000 years, if you take a look at the top of this graph, 
This is a representation of how fast change, uh, the global temperature changes. This is relative. Here we are today, it's zero change relative to the past when it was maybe minus eight degrees centigrade, globally cooler. This is when sitting over Maine, we had about 1500 feet of ice as part of a large ice sheet that covers much of North America. But the important message prior to the discovery that we made was that the climate system takes thousands of years to go through changes. Your eye has no doubt gone to the second and the third graph below, and you can see that it doesn't look like the one above. And in fact, what this represents is the fact that there were massive shifts in storm patterns, precipitation, temperature, and most importantly, these occurred in less than one to five years, which means that the climate not only does not operate slowly, but it can operate as fast as a political cycle, if not faster than a political cycle. And once it goes into one of these abrupt climate changes, it can be sustained for decades, if not hundreds of years. So of course the question is, these happen in the past under natural conditions. Would it be possible in this relatively quiet, roughly last 11,000 years that we have been living in, would it be possible for this to happen now? Let's take, we'll stay in the past for a little bit here. Now we have a record that goes from 10,000 years ago on the left to today, zero. And let's take a look at a record which tells us how much sea ice there was in the North Atlantic. This comes from that ice core. Uh, and we see that there was a very prominent uh, period of not very much sea ice in the North Atlantic 4,200 years ago. This led to the collapse of the Mesopotamian civilization. This is the Mesopotamia is in modern day Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Uh, so obviously it has a lot to do with what we're, we all think about and have been thinking about for the last couple of decades. And it turns out that this particular civilization in those areas was in a region of that just prior to that that was not uh, so dry. And all of a sudden, in a matter of just a few years, the winds shifted that brought precipitation in and the Mesopotamian empire collapsed. Many people, including myself, believe that a large part of the underpinning uh, for the Arab Spring and therefore all of the other things that happened after the Arab Spring was because of a shift into drier conditions in the Middle East today, a time when there is not so much sea ice uh, in the North Atlantic. If we take a look at the time period a thousand years ago, this was a, a time again when there wasn't that much sea ice in the North Atlantic relatively. And that's when uh, Eric the Red goes from Iceland to Greenland, sets up colonies. This is, this is an old uh, uh, structure, that, uh, obviously built out of stone uh, in Southwest Greenland where we've been working most recently. Uh, and this was a cathedral. The Norse moved uh, into this area in 1000. It was green. There wasn't that much sea ice. They could annually get resupplies from Europe. They never adopted the Inuit system of uh, sustainability by hunting uh, in the ocean, I, I should say by fishing in the ocean. So that when the dramatic change occurred in AD 1400, suddenly in less than five years, sea ice suddenly locked in or into the North Atlantic. The Norse could no longer get resupplies from Europe uh, or from Iceland. Basically the people who had set up this colony in 1000 died. And the very same thing happened uh, in terms of drought in 900 AD, the same as in the Mesopotamian empire. This is in Central America. So these are brought climate change events fast and they have a very big effect. Sometimes it's precipitation in these two cases and sometimes it's temperature with sea ice. It wasn't, we discovered this in 1992. It wasn't until 2004 that it made it into Hollywood. And actually Hollywood should be complimented because they were the first to actually recognize how serious this could be. For those of you who remember the day after tomorrow, the big question uh, at the time was when will it happen and where will you be uh, on the day after tomorrow? And the day after tomorrow in this particular case was a matter of days during which uh, obviously New York City gets covered by a tremendous mass of ice. Well, Hollywood got it right in terms of the speed, but not actually what happened. Obviously we're experiencing much more warming now. Uh, 
But uh, this whole idea of the day after tomorrow was actually based on the expedition that we had for, for several years recovering an ice core from Greenland. So uh, why is sea ice so important? Uh, why are glaciers so important? You watching this image, uh, you'll see flashing back and forth uh, changes in the white surfaces. The Greenland ice sheet stays pretty white. Obviously, when fresh snow falls there, it's even whiter, large, massive Antarctica. But then, of course, there's sea ice surrounding both Antarctica uh, uh, and much of the Arctic across the Northern Hemisphere. This migration on a seasonal basis of sea ice and snow cover is arguably the, the most remarkable, if not the biggest seasonal event uh, that occurs on the planet. So why is it important? It's important because it changes the surface of the earth over about 30% of it from white to dark. And that's important because when you have white surfaces that reflects incoming radiation, keeping the surface cool. And when you have a dark surface, either the land or the ocean, or if in particular you have sea ice, which is melted away, and sea ice is not that thick. It's only three to 10 feet thick in general. And once you melt that away, you've taken away the cap that holds the heat uh, from escaping to the atmosphere from the ocean because you have an ice cap. Uh, but also at the same time, it absorbs a lot of heat because it's a dark surface. So this is called amplification. The fact that you get rid of a white surface and substitute it for a dark surface, and in particular in the Arctic Ocean, you get literally for every one degree of warming that you get from greenhouse gases, you get at least two, if not three degrees centigrade of warming in the process. So now, uh, what part of the world is this most important in? It's important in any place that there's sea ice, but in the case of the Antarctic, we have a much more stable situation. We have a continent that's one and a half times the size of the, of the United States, and it is surrounded by a massive amount of sea ice uh, in the winter. Uh, but because the ice on average is 10,000 feet thick here, it maintains to some degree its own climate. There's certainly melting going on along the edges. But in our case, the Arctic, which we're most interested in right now, is a place in which sea ice, not that thick, is centered right over the polar regions. So you can change this surface from light colored to grayish to open ocean much more easily. You don't have to remove as much ice. Uh, so what's happened today? Today, of course, we've experienced a significant increase in greenhouse gases. And this is an ice core record that we did not collect, but collected by colleagues. It goes back 850,000 years. And the red line is showing you the variability and the amount of CO2 over the last 850,000 years. And all of a sudden you get into the industrial era and we begin to see it rise. We went over uh, 400 in about 2018. It is not impossible that we will double, more than double what we have today uh, by 2100. And the big deal here is that as of today, CO2 levels are one and a half times higher than they have ever been in the last 850,000 years. And perhaps certainly as importantly, the level of greenhouse, or I should say the rate of greenhouse gas rise is 100 times faster than it has been in the last 850,000 years. Just think about that. That's very fast, dramatic change. And that change has been most effective in literally the last few decades. So here's a plot of world temperature. This takes into account the ocean and the land going from 1948 to, to, to today, all relative to the time period 1979 to 2000, which is this line across here. And it shows you times when it's been above and when it's been below this level. And we can see that as of you know, the the 80s, we begin to see almost the first hints of really dramatic uh, warming. It's only 0.2 degrees centigrade, but this becomes very important if you happen to be very close to a white surface. And then of course it's risen far more dramatically. So since about 1950, we've experienced hmm, about one degree centigrade rise uh, in temperature, which is actually quite fast. So, 
the next big question is, um, you know, this is this is a display of what's going on all over the world. None of us live in the average global temperature. We all live in different parts of the planet. There's different heat coming into the polar into the polar regions than into the tropical regions. So what we're going to do now is we'll take a look at the most recent time period, 2005 to the present, and compare it to the earlier uh, period, 1979 to 2004, but not just in a time series. We'll look at it all over the world. This is the evolution of warming for recent era compared to the previous whatever 25 uh, years or so. So it's pretty clear. Uh, red is warm, blue is cold. Let's just look at the cold first. Parts of the southern ocean have actually been cooling a little bit. How is that possible with greenhouse gas warming? Without going into a lot of detail, and I can expand upon this later, we see uh, it turns out that the winds have actually been speeding up around Antarctica because of greenhouse gas warming and other things, and they drag surface water, which is relatively a little bit warmer, uh, away, and in the process they bring up from slightly deeper areas cold water. So we have a cold water anomaly surrounding Antarctica because of greenhouse gas warming. But we're, let's put our attention towards the Arctic and see that the Arctic, parts of the Arctic have been warming quite a bit, other parts of the Arctic have warmed dramatically faster. Now, what's going on in the Arctic in the last 20 years is really the poster child uh, for the entire planet. Uh, and it's particularly interesting because, of course, the people in the Arctic and the ecosystem of the Arctic are literally the last ones uh, in, in the population of the world that, that produce this. It's the rest of us that produce the warming that has impacted and created all of these changes. And I won't go through these. These are all whole lecture by themselves, but it's affected sea ice. It's affected uh, indigenous people, ecosystems, fishing. It just goes on and on and on. And it's a very important thing for us to pay attention to because it's a precursor of the sort of things that we will experience as the decades roll on. In addition, there is literally a new ocean appearing, an Arctic Ocean. This is sea ice covering the Arctic in 1980. And here's the, the same month and day in 2016. And obviously, as we progress farther and farther towards 2100, we will see sea ice uh, extent in, in the summer and fall getting less and less. In the winter, there'll probably still be sea ice here, but it'll be much less than now. So in effect, we are exposing a new ocean and a lot faster than we thought. Uh, because in early 2000, when people started to project that this might happen, the expectation is it would happen in 2040. Uh, then by about 2010, it was expected this would happen in 2025. And then around 2014 or 2012, they thought it would happen in 2015. And basically, it had literally already happened. So let's take a look. Uh, in a little bit more detail, let's look at the fastest period of change, 2007 to 2012, that, uh, and in particular, the Russian Eastern Arctic. And it turns out that in this area, which warmed up the, the fastest, uh, the annual increase in temperature uh, uh, between, well, I should say the mean annual, a rise in temperature was about eight degrees Fahrenheit. Just imagine what an eight degree Fahrenheit rise in temperature would do to a place like Maine. In the Arctic, you can't quite tell it from this, but you have to take my word for it. This is the equivalent of doubling the length of the summer. So that's probably the best analogy. Imagine Maine with the summer twice as long as it is today. It's already increased by about one week uh, in the last few years. And what's even more dramatic, and this has a lot to do with the climate change, is that this magnitude increase, eight degrees Fahrenheit in five years, uh, and uh, not only the magnitude, well, the magnitude and the speed, sorry, is equivalent to the abrupt climate change that occurred 11 and a half thousand years ago, which is the transition between the last vestiges of the ice age and modern day climate. So what we experienced 2007 to 2012, and which is sustained now, is as massive a change, not quite as large an area, but as massive a change as occurred 11 and a half thousand years ago. So 
what does this mean? What happens when you begin to warm the Arctic? This uh, red line that you see uh, mo moving along here is the jet stream. Uh, it's the edge of what's also called the polar vortex, and it separates cold air in the Arctic from warm air in the middle to low latitudes. And the more, the stronger these winds are, the better job they do of separating the cold from the warm air. As the Arctic begins to warm, uh, the temperature gradient between the Arctic uh, and the mid-latitudes begins to flatten. And that means that these winds begin to be much more irregular. Uh, much more embayed. You can see how embayed they are here. And this allows cold air to be pushed much farther south, warm air to be pushed much farther north. Uh, remember again that as air masses, air masses are constantly moving around the planet. And as they do this, they are transporting heat. Uh, and wherever cold and warm come together, there's an instability. They're transporting moisture. Therefore, you should expect flooding and droughts, depending on where these tongues of, war of air go. And you also have transport of pollutants. So a lot of remarkable things have happened, and we know about some of them in Maine. But let's look at some really particularly dramatic ones. Uh, this is an event that first started in the winter of 2014-15 and has been repeated uh, more regularly since then. This is the middle of winter absolute darkness in the Arctic. You can see the shape of the jet stream. That red arrow shows you that warm air could actually make its way right into the center of the Arctic. And without going into a lot of detail, if you look at the temperature plot here, the temperature in the Arctic in the middle of winter, in the middle of darkness for not a long time, a day or two, several times was above freezing. This is directly from Santa Claus, so we know it's true. The other thing that's happened, uh, of course, in the Western, in Western North America, we've experienced tremendous wildfires. What do these wildfires have to do with the jet stream, which of course is related, its behavior is related to the Arctic. Um, as the jet stream begins to become more and more irregular, moisture that might direct, be directly brought in, for example, to California, where the wildfires were particularly bad, uh, is forced northward. As it's forced northward over the North American West, uh, the moisture is dropped, it begins to dry. Uh, because the jet stream pattern is now becoming irregular, the winds increase. So you have the perfect situation. You have less moisture coming into California, which makes the, the forest dry. You have high winds. Uh, and as a consequence, more and more fires, which are expected with these instabilities that will occur uh, over coming decades, unfortunately, in California and many other places. And let's take a look at the cold snap that we had uh, this past February using Climate Reanalyzer. Uh, we see that that cold snap that we experienced, which was about 18 degrees centigrade colder than the 1979 to 2000 uh, average, was actually quite anomalous in the Northern Hemisphere. Parts of North America and even parts of the Arctic were 20 degrees centigrade warmer than they would normally be. So how can you have cold, warm, cold, warm? It's all because of the shape of the jet stream. And the more irregular the jet stream, uh, the more unstable uh, the conditions will be. So then there's another wild card that appears in the Arctic too. And as the Arctic uh, glaciers are melting, as sea ice is melting, uh, there is more and more uh, permafrost, frozen ground exposed. Half of the Arctic is in fact frozen ground. And what happens is all of the organic material that's been trapped in there for a long time, for thousands and tens of thousands of years, uh, begins to be released. And this pit with the fire in it, nobody threw a match. Well, sorry, nobody actually threw uh, any kind of fuel in there. This was simply methane that was trapped under the snow and ice. And they did throw a match in. Uh, methane is 30 to 50 times more effective in trapping heat than CO2. So this is a real wild card. As more and more methane gets released, we might expect to see faster and faster changes. Uh, and in fact, this is a projection, a uh, climate model projection, uh, not done by us, but done by climate modelers that suggests what the world, what the Arctic might look like uh, by 2090 to 2100, uh, a five to six degree centigrade increase. 
Uh, remember that we've already experienced in the Eastern Arctic about a four to five degree centigrade increase. It may not take as long as 2090 uh, to 2100 if in fact the methane gets released because these models are all projected primarily on the basis of CO2 emissions and some steady change in methane, not a sudden new methane source. So let's jump to something slightly different. Other work we've done in, uh, in Greenland, uh, if you remember in the 1980s, the big question was not uh, greenhouse gas warming, it wasn't greenhouse gases at all, it was acid rain. Uh, nitrogen and sulfur getting into the atmosphere. It was the same debate. Was it because of us? Was it part of natural variability? So we were supported by the Environmental Protection Agency to go to Greenland, drill back in time, and see whether or not we could tell whether or whether these acid rain levels were directly related to emissions from North America. And remember that the emissions had been tracked. We knew what they were. We just didn't know what they were like in the past. Uh, prior to the Industrial Revolution. We found out that, yeah, the levels of uh, nitrogen and sulfur in the atmosphere had increased quite dramatically, but as, if not more importantly, we found out that clean air legislation works. Uh, we also found out, as I've already from uranium and now from acid rain uh, and many other things that are trapped in glaciers, that in the last 150 years, this bar on the right, compared to the previous 5,000 years, uh, the levels of all of these things have accelerated dramatically. These are the undeniable human impacts, even if people don't believe in warming. There is no way of escaping the fact that we have changed the air quality that we live in. And I've only plotted it back to 5,000 years because otherwise you'd never see the last 100 uh, or so years. I would go as far as to say that the air, the chemistry of the air that we experience today is absolutely unparalleled in Earth history. Obviously because of everything from engineered chemicals to radioactivity, but even in many cases, the levels of toxic substances such as lead. So we live in a very unique time. As a consequence of climate change and greenhouse gas increase, and then all of the things that go along with greenhouse gases, <clears throat> we've created, and this is the most depressing part of the talk, it gets a little bit better as it goes on, and at the end it gets much more hopeful, so don't, don't lose faith. Um, these toxic substances impact our respiratory health, neurological cancer, they affect ocean acidification, a variety of things, vector-borne diseases. Why is this important? Turns out that one in 10 deaths worldwide are related to bad air quality, and that translates into 7 million premature deaths per year. So one of the things we did in our institute was to develop software that allows people uh, who live in the United States, because the US is the only one that actually shares this air quality, to see how good our air quality is. <clears throat> and the number, the number 10 is the best number. Nobody gets a 10 uh, because of greenhouse gases and other things. In fact, about the best you get is a 7 which is Seattle, uh, uh, where we live, you know, Augusta, Portland, we have five, is, it's not great, but it's actually not bad to compare it to Los Angeles, Chicago, a lot of other areas. And if you go to 10 Green, you can actually dig down and you can look at the 10 different measurements for the 10 different uh, EPA pollutants, these are greenhouse gases, toxic metals. Green means it's safe level there. Red means that it's an unsafe level, and gray means that there's no, uh, there's no information at all. And this was a very important reason for us to do this because we wanted people to look at their 10 green score, see whether or not all of the measurements that affect their health are actually being made. And if we look uh, some of these 10 green stores, uh, scores together, you can use it, for example, to decide what part of the country you'd like to live in. The Northeast is where we live in particular is not bad. Uh, you start to go into other parts of the country, it's not so great. And obviously if you're in the Northwest, uh, certainly not California, but if you're in the Northwest, you get a lot of clean Pacific air uh, coming in. So um, it turns out that the things that we've experienced that we think about as climate change are not just temperature, uh, they're also air quality, and they're the effects of temperature and air quality. And these are all of the 
I'll call them surprises, environmental surprises that have occurred as a consequence of us playing around in the last and emitting what we have. Obviously, decline in Arctic sea ice, various extreme events, sea level rise, you can read them all, I don't need to go through them. Uh, so a lot of things have happened. I'll, I'll mention, uh, well, actually we'll skip it for right now. But what's most important, however, is that legislation, as I suggested, with respect to acid rain has actually been very effective unless you start weakening this regulation. And the Red Star tells you that we've done a pretty good job with acid rain. We've done a great job with reducing, starting to reduce ozone holes, although the actual healing of the process takes 50 to 75 years. This, this is the Montreal Protocol. We've done a great job of preventing above ground testing, ab atomic bomb testing, that radioactive material that was emitted into the atmosphere prior uh, to the ban and on above ground bomb testing basically said there's radioactivity from that accident that's made to the South Pole, federal legislation for, because we know this legislation is effective. So now a quick comparison. How does climate change compare, for example, to COVID-19? Uh, COVID-19 is utmost in our minds right now. Uh, both COVID-19 and climate change have local to global effects. Obviously, both impact human health. As it turns out, the food insecurity that is created as a consequence of climate change, for example, uh, the drought in the Middle East, uh, changes in uh, growing seasons, these have made people along with the human, the health consequences of climate change have made people far more susceptible to COVID-19 than they would have been if we hadn't been as stressed. And both of these obviously create stress. Uh, mitigation, well, we're, it's super impressive, obviously, what's happened with vaccines. And with any luck at all, we'll see the other side of COVID-19 relatively soon. Climate change is different. Climate change is going to be with us for a long time, and the mitigation needs to be taken more seriously. Both of these have created new norms. Don't need to tell you about COVID-19. Uh, but the new norm for the climate system is instability. That's the key word. The climate system is less stable. Uh, than it has been in, in most several of our lives. Uh, and in both cases, they provide new perspective. We know that as a consequence of COVID, greenhouse gas levels decreased dramatically in the atmosphere. At the same time, toxic substances decreased because there was less industrial activity, fewer of us driving around. And that had a very small effect on climate change, the decrease in greenhouse gases. But it was yet another reminder of the fact that uh, while greenhouse gases are very hard uh, to mitigate, uh, the toxic substances that go with them can be taken out of the atmosphere in a matter of days. Uh, and we know that the levels of cadmium, which causes autism in infants, not the only cause. We know that the levels are of small particulates, which are right at the marginal level from throughout much of the United States. So now let's turn to Maine quickly. Maine has a very diverse climate range. It's the equivalent basically of going halfway up Scandinavia and halfway down Europe. Uh, in 2009, our institute was tasked by Governor Bal uh, Baldacci uh, to put together what turned out to be the first report about a, a state uh, and its future. It's a, an understanding of, of where we were up to 2009 and where we might go in the future. We updated that in 2005, 15, 2019, and 2020, and it has formed the basis uh, for the Maine Climate Council. Uh, Governor Mills uh, has been very impressive in terms of uh, turning our Maine state government towards much more positive thinking about what we knew, need to do about climate change. And the scientific assessment of climate change is really uh, a synthesis of most of these, of these documents, plus obviously more things added. Plus, most importantly, the additions of ideas related to policy, much more understanding of impacts and a variety of things. 
So turning, focusing even more on Maine, uh, Maine experienced uh, in, uh, in past times and certainly uh, in the instrumental era, uh, periods during which Penobscot Bay was completely frozen for a good portion of the winter. Uh, you could drive a car uh, from Camden across Penobscot Bay. The most recent freezing that we've had of Penobscot Bay, and it was not that dramatic, was in 1971. If we take a look at the temperature, and the, this comes from, from our reports that I just showed you and from the Maine Climate Council report, uh, uh, since about 1895, temperatures increased about three degrees Fahrenheit. This has been primarily with an increase in overnight temperatures uh, and some increases in daytime temperatures. And we've experienced since 1998, the six warmest years on record. If we take a look at temperature, over these three different time periods, there's temperature plot I just showed you, we can see that the temperature increase, which is the lighter, uh, the yellowish and the green, has been most prominent in the coastal areas, less so in the northern areas. This is largely because of the jet stream and also because obviously getting into higher latitude uh, and continental interiors are a little bit, uh, they, they can create their own climate. If we take a look at precipitation and drought, uh, since about 1895, there's been roughly a six inch increase uh, in uh, six, six inches more of precipitation uh, and the largest increase in the last 20 years. The expectation is that this precipitation increase, this moisture increase will continue. However, if you look back through the record and I'll talk about this in a bit more detail in a moment, there are periods of drought. Uh, and the question is, will we have more periods of drought? Will they be larger? So predictions for Maine based on climate models and the climate models basically take, uh, try to reconstruct the physics of the climate system. They tend to look at it globally and they take into account different scenarios uh, for uh, temperature, uh, for uh, greenhouse gas rise. Uh, somehow my pointer has has died here, uh, but the RCP 8.5 is greenhouse gas emissions continuing as they are and getting higher and higher. Uh, 2.6 is a much more conservative. And if you take a look at uh, the plot to the right, you'll see the gray uh, is basically the range of temperatures up to the present. This is based on the instrumental record. Uh, and then if you go into the red line to the right, that's the projection with possibly an eight degree centigrade rise if we really let greenhouse gases go crazy. And if we begin to mitigate and flatten out back to probably 1990 levels, that's the blue plot here, we might actually see a flattening out of the temperature uh, at about two to three degrees centigrade by the middle of the uh, 21st century. If we take a look at Maine, based only on the climate models, and let me go back one second, you notice that the climate models have a lot less variability in them. So everything from today onward is basically a rather linear change with not much variability because the models can't actually give you as much regional detail as we would like, uh, nor can they reconstruct the variability so easily. If we go back in the instrumental record, we see that there's a lot of variability. We know there'll be variability in the future. So we expect that by 2030 to 2050, Maine's temperature will rise by about three degrees Fahrenheit, as much temperature rise as we've experienced since 1895. We know that with this temperature rise, particularly since 2000, we'll see an increase in ticks uh, in the state. When, when my wife and I moved to the state in 2000, we left New Hampshire, which was filled with ticks, to Maine, no ticks. Obviously, it's different today. The number of days during which the temperature will rise above 95 degrees Fahrenheit will triple by mid-century. Uh, as it turns out, if you increase the temperature three or four degrees Fahrenheit, even in the mid 70s of Fahrenheit, the number of uh, heat stroke related hospitalizations doubles. So uh, heat stroke and obviously disabilities related to heat will increase dramatically in the future. Precipitation is expected to increase another six inches by 2035 to 54. Uh, by 2050, we should begin to see uh, some of the dramatic changes in forest biomes. Uh, Gulf of Maine, as we know, is one of the fastest warming bodies of water on the planet. We know that the lobster industry 
has effectively failed to the south of us. And once we get to 68 degrees Fahrenheit, which happens very rarely in the Gulf of Maine, but is beginning to happen for a day or two every now, now and then, that's the mortality number or threshold uh, for lobsters. <clears throat> so as warming occurs, lobster industry will change. Well, those climate models are great. They give you the trends, but we can actually do better on the local to regional scale and add a bit more variability. Um, and why do we want to do this? Because we want to be able to understand not just it, what the trend is to 2100, but we want to be able to understand much uh, at a much finer scale, maybe the next 10 to 20 years, and we want to understand what's happening in Maine. <clears throat> so for the blueberry industry, it turns out that blueberries obviously like warmer temperatures, longer growing seasons, uh, moisture, and as the Gulf of Maine warms, which it has already and will continue to, it'll allow more, more moisture to be blown on shore uh, during the summer season. The summer season will be longer and blueberries will probably be pretty happy in the future. Uh, if we take a look at the relationship be, uh, between El Nino and the quick answer to El Nino is it's a temperature fluctuation in the Pacific Ocean that has far reaching effects over North America. Turns out that during El Nino events, Maine tends to be dry. Uh, it behaves very differently. Uh, obviously you see the little uh, pinkish spot over Maine compared to the bluish spot in the rest of North America. Because of the jet stream in particular, uh, Maine reacts differently to El Ninos. And uh, during the El Nino, we had one not too long ago, three, four years ago, uh, Western Maine and, uh, New and Northern New Hampshire tend to be drier. Uh, if we had another volcanic event, remember in 1991-92, we had the Pinatubo event. It was a very large volcanic event. These usually occur every 20 years. We have not had one as big as Pinatubo, uh, and we're long past that. What happens in northeastern United States is that it gets colder and it gets drier for about one to two years. And if we look at the effect of Mount Pinatubo, 91 to 93, on the Arctic, it resulted in a four degree centigrade cooling. So we should expect the Arctic sea ice uh, to begin to grow again for a short period, one or two years. But if we're thinking about transporting things back and forth across the Arctic, if we're thinking about all of the uh, climate instabilities created by the Arctic, the Arctic has a dramatic impact on the rest <clears throat> of the Northern Hemisphere. So one volcanic event can have a big long-term impact. So now, uh, if we take a look at a very idealized view of 2020 to 2040, that gray dashed line is showing us what the models say. <clears throat> and the models are right. The trend will be warming. But superimposed on that warming might, for example, be an El Nino event, which would mean uh, warmer and drier for Maine. A La Nina, which is the opposite of that, means colder and wetter. A volcanic eruption means uh, drier and uh, drier and colder. And the red arrow in there tells us that if methane is released at higher rates than it is now, which is certainly likely, we'll have another abrupt climate change, which will potentially be uh, not just confined to the Arctic, but to much larger area in the Northern Hemisphere. So there are a lot of plausible scenarios for the future, and we need to think about all of them. The ones that are just sort of the, the most minimal, uh, which would be cutting greenhouse gases down and flattening out of temperature by 2040 to 2050. We also need to think about the most dramatic alternatives in our planning. A plausible planning scenario is all about how do you mitigate and adapt to as many plausible scenarios as you can. So now Maine, this is the, this is the encouraging part of the story. We live in a good place for sure. Uh, we have a lot of potential. Other than El Nino events and volcanoes, we have plentiful water. And the expectation is that we will most years out of each decade. Our forests, we now know, sequester about 75% of the carbon emissions, emissions that come from our very small population. But nevertheless, it puts us in a very good situation. And we obviously have a, a remarkable marine uh, opportunity, uh, which if we manage correctly, uh, and make sure that we uh, understand 
uh, which fish uh, are there and how to manage them puts us in a very good situation. We're also in a great situation for wind uh, and solar power, but in particular wind power. If we were to install uh, the field of uh, wind turbines that are now being projected for the Gulf of Maine, it would be the equivalent of 10 to 12 nuclear power plants. We would become the Saudi Arabia of energy. In the process, it would make us energy independent. We would have tons of excess um, energy. It would reduce uh, pollution because we our major sources of pollution are uh, energy and automobiles. It would re reduce toxic substance releases. Uh, in the process, uh, as the Arctic continues to warm, obviously, uh, particularly Portland, but the coast of Maine, it will become the e Eastern gateway uh, through the Arctic as ships go back and forth. Whether one likes it or not, the Arctic will open up significantly more. Uh, we already have the Icelandic shipping company, Imskip moving to Portland, uh, and we already have tremendous increase in shipping between Maine and Scandinavia. With all of this energy, with all, all of this precipitation, organic farming will grow uh, in Maine. We already have the highest per capita uh, number of um, beer, dis, uh, beer making, homemade beer making uh, in the country. And along with that, we'll go organic farming because we'll have the energy and we'll have the, the moisture that we need. In the process, our economy will increase. There'll be more jobs and these jobs in the energy industry, particularly offshore wind, uh, will be very important in employing many of the people who might very well lose their jobs uh, in the lobster industry, but who are experienced in the marine environment and, and the, the pay for these jobs and the, sus the sustainability of these jobs uh, is quite obvious. Uh, in the process, I've projected for the last few years that we'll see a doubling in the population of Maine. And whether one likes it or not, we should prepare ourselves for it and think about how, in fact, uh, when we think about expanding or not schools, when we think about roads, when we think about where we put things, we need to keep in mind that we might have a, an increased population. There'll be climate refugees coming to us. And these climate refugees are not necessarily coming from other parts of the world. They'll be coming from other parts of the United States. And uh, for for those of us in Maine, uh, our quality of life will most likely be sustained. Yeah, we have vector-borne diseases. Yes, we have more storms. Uh, yes, we have instability in climate, but quality of life compared to a lot of other places will be quite good. So climate change has tremendous impacts. It impacts health, economy, uh, frequency of catastrophes, geopolitics. I won't talk about these in detail. I've already touched on them. Uh, perhaps the most pertinent thing in terms of my presentation today is the are the geopolitical influences of a warming Arctic. As you know, uh, Russia has already claimed the Arctic. Uh, many countries are doing it, but there are amazing new uh, inroads that are being made between all of the Arctic adjacent countries and many other countries for what the future of the Arctic will be. Finally, what can we all do to make this happen in the, uh, and look for a brighter future? We can stay well informed. The Maine Climate Council report, I really encourage you to read it. It's a very impressive forward thinking report. And in the process, obviously, the better educated we become, the better we will be at, at voting uh, for the policies that will be projected as a consequence. <laughs> Look at the Climate Change Institute, uh, uh, our software climate reanalyzer in 10 green so that you, if you're ever interested in understanding what's going on today, what went on in the past, what our air quality was, you can refer to these. Um, so stay informed and inform others, uh, energize our legislators through voting, support climate friendly activities like the Sierra Club, adopt climate friendly solutions. We can always increase our efficiency. As you all know, there are grassroots organizations jumping up all over the state that are doing some very basic but extremely important things. They're creating wooden frames with plastic over them that can be put on uh, people's windows to decrease their heating costs. Average Mainer spends about 10% of their income on heating their house and on energy. If you, can, if you can drop that down to 5% or 8%, it makes a very big difference. And if we eventually begin to have 
our own renewable sources of energy will even be in better shape. Uh, reduce your emissions, obviously driving less. Cars are the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. And then there's a very big movement uh, for reuse uh, in Maine and obviously many other areas too, uh, and obviously reducing what we have. So <clears throat> we all need to insist on clean air, clean water and resource preservation. It's uh, the New Green Deal is exactly uh, this. Uh, it turns out that the original Green Deal uh, promoted uh, or put forward by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt did actually talk about some of these things. It wasn't, they weren't the biggest issues in that, but this, the, the fact that we all deserve clean air and water and to preserve our resources ought to be an inalienable right that we have uh, as humans and for our ecosystem. And then as you turn, start to turn to the economic side, if we had clean air and clean water, we would be much healthier than we are today decreasing one of our most important or highest, I should say, uh, costs in, in the United States healthcare. So uh, here's the concluding statement. We've been making a journey into climate uh, and humans, we've been impacting the climate system to some degree and certainly our environment ever since we uh, started uh, hunting, uh, cutting down forests, but the biggest impacts and the ones that can actually be seen in the atmosphere start around 9,000 years ago with agriculture, in particular, uh, growing rice. Because as you grow rice, you grow it in a, in a, in a water environment, sort of a semi-saturated uh, uh, state. And that's exactly the place that you emit methane. So we have uh, levels of methane started to increase about 9,000 years ago because of human activity, even that far back. We were also burning forests uh, in order to go hunting. Uh, the most dramatic uh, increase or consequence uh, impact on climate change starts with the Industrial Revolution around 1850. It's in the 1980s uh, that we really begin to realize, and also obviously with Earth Day 51 years ago, 1970, uh, that something is happening. We began to see glaciers getting smaller, and glaciers are an amazing integrator of what goes on in the in temperature and precipitation. And glaciers have no reason to be political. They have no reason to tell anything other than exactly what's impacting them. And we know glaciers have been retreating quite dramatically since the 1980s. When we were working on Everest in 2019, we even found that the very highest glacier on Mount Everest, uh, almost 27,000 feet, had lost tremendous amount of volume, even at that elevation. So today, uh, we've entered, in my opinion, the age of climate decision and how we move forward, the consequences and even the opportunities for the future are really up to us. And although it doesn't sound very environmentally minded and I consider myself to be a very environmentally sensitive person, there are opportunities for the future. Uh, people who, for example, can figure out the right sort of crops. Uh, there is a scientist uh, who has already, who works in Bangladesh, uh, who's be, who's developed a salt resistant crop uh, for coastal, for, for Bangladesh, uh, because sea level is rising and they're obviously getting much more salt coming in. There's so many other things uh, that we could be doing uh, that will increase the quality of life and, and help us to adapt and in the process mitigate. Should have gone back. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Majewski. Um, just a clarifying question first. Did you, did you say, or did your slide show that at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, lobsters begin to die? Yes. And I even checked that. Uh, it, uh, it's, a, it's a scientific reference that's, that's attached to that. But uh, I even checked that. And then I checked um, how many times, you know, how often does the temperature go above 68 degrees Fahrenheit in the Gulf of Maine? It's not very often. It's a day every now and then, but the numbers of those days are increasing. Uh, so yeah, we know that the Gulf of Maine is pretty far from 68 degrees Fahrenheit right now. Uh, but as you begin to think, but the, you know, we will gradually get closer and closer to this. Uh, whether or not the Gulf of Maine will ever be 68 degrees Fahrenheit throughout this, the whole summer or not, I don't know. But it is enough uh, to push the lobsters uh, into a very uncomfortable state, not only because of their, um, their life cycle, but also because of the parasites that impact them. 
Thank you. We have a couple of questions for um, from our chat. We invite anybody that's uh, in the audience, if you'd like to type into the chat a question you may have, or if you just want to raise your hand and um, you know ask it directly, that's also fine. Um, the first question we have is, how does Maine fare compared to the rest of the country and the world, in your opinion, about the climate change issues, and how likely is it that we can stop this or even reverse these trends? I think Maine is, um, that uh, Maine Climate Council report is very impressive. Uh, it, that isn't to say that there aren't uh, countries, Iceland, uh, Denmark, uh, several others that aren't more advanced, Germany, aren't more advanced in terms of their approach to understanding and mitigating and adapting to climate change. But I'd say Maine, Maine's a real leader uh, in the United States. Uh, I remember when I first moved to Maine in 2020, uh, I could see that there was a lot of interest in obviously preserving Maine. Uh, and, but California at the time was really the most progressive in terms of climate change. And I would always like to say that, yeah, California is a very wealthy state. Maine's not a wealthy state. Uh, and, and yet there are plenty of things we can do about climate change uh, that don't necessarily require money. They require activism, voting, uh, conservation, resource uh, uh, development, or not development, but preserving our resources. Uh, and I'm sorry, you asked another question. There was another question in there too. Yes, it was, it was kind of a double question I, I yeah. hate you with. How does Maine fare compared to the rest of the country and the world? And then also how likely is it that we can stop this or even reverse these trends? Yeah, obviously that's very important. Uh, can we stop it? No, uh, we've bought into what we have so far uh, and it will continue. Question is how much can we mitigate? Um, and I think, you know, one of the approaches is why should we do anything if, in fact, China isn't? It turns out that you now China and the United States are the biggest emitters. And one could say that uh, if China and or the United States don't do enough, then what's the purpose of even uh, trying to think about the future? It's just going to get worse and worse. Well, um, the answer is that we all need to do as much as we can. Uh, and even if the warming continues and we don't mitigate it as much as we would like to, by decreasing greenhouse gas uh, emissions into the atmosphere, remember, we also decrease toxic substances that go into the atmosphere. And those drop out really fast. And imagine living in a world that was much closer to our world 2000 years ago when lead levels were almost zero in the atmosphere, when there was no cadmium uh, floating around in the atmosphere, when we didn't have as much arsenic in the atmosphere, when we didn't have all of these engineered uh, chemicals. So there are plenty of things that we can do that will make the quality of our life and our health better uh, for the future uh, without necessarily having even the major countries decrease greenhouse gases. We can make it better for ourselves uh, locally and regionally. Uh, having said that, uh, China, as of the last few years, uh, for obvious reasons, has in many ways be, uh, taken the world stage in terms of its interest in trying to re reduce uh, greenhouse gas warming. Uh, now with our new administration, I think we will begin to take the lead back again. That's critically important. And China and the United States together could be very, very powerful uh, in mitigating greenhouse gas warming. Uh, there are estimates coming out all, all the time about uh, how many electric cars we'll have by 2030 to 2040 to 2050. Uh, the likelihood of more and more renewable energy. Uh, remember that there are more people uh, involved. Uh, there are more jobs in renewable energy than there are in the coal industry now. It's an absolutely rapidly growing field. And I think the Biden administration has been very smart when they talk about renewable energy because they always talk about jobs at the same time. So that it isn't a matter of taking something away. Uh, it's a matter of creating new opportunities. And even in the most perfect world, we are not going to be able to trans. Uh, to transfer into renewable energy in less than 20 to 25 years. So the infrastructure for energy that we have now, we will need 
uh, until the next 20 to 25 years, if not longer. The big question is, should we take that infrastructure, which in the 1950s to the 1980s were probably the best energy infrastructure in the world, but which is now old, should we rebuild it uh, this old style en uh, source of energy, or should we just jump into the 21st century the way many other countries are and consider the fact that we're going to have a 21st century infrastructure rather than a 20th century infrastructure? Thank you. Another question is, why is the Gulf of Maine warming at a faster rate, in your opinion? That's a very good question. Uh, it has a lot to do uh, with the fact that there is uh, more warm water uh, that's moving its way northward. Uh, this, remember the Gulf Stream uh, divides, it basically divides warm water to the south and cold water to the north. And we tend to think of the Gulf Stream as a stream, uh, but it's not necessarily a confined stream. It's got a lot of eddies that come off the edges of it. Uh, and as a consequence, small currents can make their way uh, farther north and into some of these subterranean uh, regions of the Gulf of Maine and allow it to warm. But at the same time, obviously, the air has warmed. Uh, so it's a consequence of more warm water getting in, uh, particularly from the south, uh, and more warm air uh, heating the surface. Thank you. There's another question that there's new evidence of pollutants found on Everest. Did these uh, new pollutants or new evidence of pollutants come from winds or the effect of the, the hundreds of climbers? That's actually that comes from our expedition. Uh, and that is a very good que uh, question. Uh, and, and the papers do, the scientific papers do state very clearly uh, that it's from climbers. Uh, and uh, at, as obviously should be expected. Anywhere people go, microplastics and PFASs drop off our clothing and, and they're everywhere. Uh, we had hoped to be able to show whether or not there were microplastics and various toxic substances uh, in the snow during the non-climbing season. Uh, but when we got to the highest site where we could collect uh, an ice core, uh, it turns out that the upper hundreds of years were missing. Uh, and that's because warming has impacted uh, the top of the, of the highest glacier in Mount Everest. So we could not, as we have been able to do in other places, be able to say, well, here's what the levels are of, let's say, lead uh, today, and here's what they were a few years ago. It's just plain missing, the, the upper part of the record. Um, we'll, we'll go back again. Uh, and we'll try to find another place, probably a little bit farther away, maybe slightly lower elevation, uh, where we can uh, determine that. But we know exactly, I, I, should, I shouldn't say we know what we're going to find. We know that at a lower elevation on the north side of Everest, where we've been working closely with the Chinese for about 20 years now, where, there, where the snow is preserved uh, from today all the way back, it's about uh, 2,000 feet lower that in fact, uh, the levels of toxic substances are definitely much higher in the younger snow than in the older snow. What we don't know, because we weren't measuring microplastics and PFASs at that time, is whether or not microplastics and PFASs are uh, in uh, at that lower elevation where we can get a better record. So we'll be going back to Everest uh, once COVID allows us to, and ideally we'll be, we'll be able to answer that question. But that was a very perceptive question. Thank you. Um, another question is, do you or Sierra Club have reports like your presentation for each state? For each of? For each state in the United States, so not just Maine? Oh, that's a good question. You'd have to ask the Sierra Club. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do know that we were the first state to do this. Uh, I'm guessing that they do exist for other states. I can tell you that there are reports put out by the USGS, uh, US Geological Survey, uh, NOAA, uh, that uh, cover the entire United States. And they'll show you, they'll give you good information for where you are. They may not be quite as specific, however, for the state that you happen to be interested in. Thank you. 
And our last question in chat is that we have heard that the Gulf Stream might stall as a consequence of climate change. Do you see this as a real possibility? It's a very good question too. Uh, it, it turns out that in the past, and we can see this not only from our ice core records, but also from deep sea records, there are times when the Gulf Stream has actually uh, moved farther north, farther south, or slowed down. Uh, one of the, the, the things that determine uh, the strength of the Gulf Stream have to do with the density of the water. Uh, and the Gulf Stream is just one part of a literally around the world uh, a circuit of water uh, that occurs. And it turns out that the water that comes from the South Atlantic makes its way along the East Coast of the United States and then goes across uh, to Europe. As it starts to make its way across to Europe and actually begin to mix with some of the Arctic waters, by that point, uh, it turns out that the water is a little bit saltier, which makes it denser. And it's saltier because of the wet, of the fact that the in the tropical regions, the winds are very strong. They blow from uh, east to west and they, they take moisture out of the ocean, leaving behind, making the Atlantic a little bit saltier. But even more effective uh, is the addition of cold water in the North Atlantic. And as Greenland begins to melt, which it is, it obviously gives off cold, uh, fresh water. Uh, and <clears throat> as you um, as you add fresh water uh, to the to the Gulf Stream area, you actually decrease the density uh, of the water, and the water is no longer able to sink as easily. And the less it sinks, the remember that example I showed in the very beginning. As the winds blow over the the, uh, the Southern Ocean, they drag surface water. Uh, bringing up cold water. Well, in many ways, it's exactly the same thing here. The less wind you have blowing across the surface of the ocean or the less uh, dense by adding fresh water, the net result is that you, uh, you don't have as much dense water. It doesn't sink and it doesn't pull surface water across. Under the circumstance in which uh, more and more melting occurs off uh, from the Greenland ice sheet, the Gulf Stream and that region will be, the water will become less dense, it won't sink as fast, and it won't drag warm air from North America over to Europe as easily. So it is not impossible that as Greenland starts to melt, uh, changing the density of the, Gulf, of the Gulf Stream water, that the Gulf Stream will not move as fast, and that the net result will be that the eastern part of, uh, of North America or United States will tend to warm even more because the heat will be kept on that side more and there'll be less, there'll be less heat taken less often over to Scandinavia and Scandinavia will actually get colder under that circumstance. So sort of weird to think about it, uh, but the melting of Greenland could actually make Scandinavia colder. Wow, well, there's a lot of information. Thank you so much. Um, we have a quick last minute question. Has our ability to forecast weather events kept pace with changes in our climate? It's a really good question. Um, obviously, uh, you know, meteorologists and climatologists are very good at predicting uh, over a few days, uh, probably even up to a week or 10 days in, in many cases. Uh, and if you wanted to make, a, so we're very good at that. Uh, we probably the climate models without a doubt are good at telling us what the trend will be. Uh, so we know 20, 30 years, 50 years from now, uh, if we continue as we are, it will get warmer. It's in the shorter time period where it gets more complicated. Uh, those climate models, and I showed you a little bit of the data uh, about midway through, those climate models are produced in the following way. Uh, you take a weather model exactly the same way that weather forecasts are produced uh, and you take the physics from that weather uh, uh, model and you now let it run not just for days, but you let it run for weeks and you let it run for months. And the net result is that you're actually creating a climate model in the process. 
Um, when you compare the results of that climate model to what we know has already happened, and you can do that by uh, taking the climate model and seeing what it would have, what would have guessed the weather was like, uh, the climate models tend to underrepresent what's going on. They don't have as much uh, variability in them. So that's why the, um, the climate models are great for general behavior, but they, we don't understand the physics of the climate system well enough uh, to actually predict what's going to necessarily happen in the next 10 or 20 years, which is exactly why we're using these other tools, the possibility of a volcanic event, the possibility of, of an El Nino and a variety of other things. Uh, so we can't necessarily say there'll be a volcanic event in five years, but we can say that the likelihood of having a big one in the next 10 or 20 years, or if not less, is very high. And therefore, <clears throat> we should prepare ourselves for a one to two degrees centigrade drop in temperature in a place like Maine and a four degrees centigrade drop in temperature for the Arctic, which has big implications uh, for all of us. So the answer is we can't tell exactly what's going to happen in the next 10 years, but we can tell you what the likelihood is of having, you know, out of the next 10 years, probably one year will be dry. Uh, and maybe one or two years will be cooler than average, but in general, it will be warmer. Thank you so much. I think that brings us to the end of our questions. Um, I'm gonna see if I can share the last screen here. There we go. And it, I, I should say, if anybody would like to, um, to look at this PowerPoint, I know it's recorded, but um, I'll send it off to you uh, for for the Sierra Club and anybody likes it, they can or wants it, you can get it from the Sierra Club or you can send me an email. I'd be happy to send it to you. That is so generous. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone um, for tuning in tonight. Um, we want to make sure that you're aware of our um, uh, offering tomorrow. I'm going to post that in the chat for if people are interested in signing up. For on Earth Day, we'll host a panel discussion on the intersectionality of racism, economy, and climate change. The speakers will include Josh Wood, who is the race and climate justice organizer and co-organizing director for Maine Strikes. Anya Wright, who is the grassroots climate action organizer for Sierra Club Maine. And Davis Taylor, professor of economics and quantitative social studies at the College of the Atlantic. So just a, a major thank you to you, Dr. Majewski, and to everyone who tuned in tonight and an invitation for tomorrow. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much.